You've trusted in my Father, now trust in me also. In my Father's house there are many rooms, and I go to prepare a place for you, and then I will return and take you to be with me. And the disciples said, but Lord, we don't know how to go there. How do we know how to get there? And the Lord answered, you do know. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Lord, we thank you that we can call you Father. Thank you, Lord, that we are children of the living God. Thank you that we are blessed beyond our full understanding. Thank you that we are loved, that a multitude of sin is covered by that love. Thank you that your grace is sufficient. Thank you that your mercy is all covering. Thank you that your compassion restores and redeems. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and who you have made us to be. And so, Lord, I I would crave your blessing upon us this morning. Lord, I would crave your presence, Holy Spirit, that you would move amongst us, that you would touch us, that you would work with us. Lord, I would pray especially for those that are hurting this morning, that, Lord, you would restore what has been eaten. For those that are struggling with pain, that you would remove it, that even for this short while, they'd be able to focus on you. For those that are struggling financially or emotionally or spiritually, Lord, I pray you would be their all-sufficient God. And Lord, as we open your word this morning now, I pray you would give us fresh understanding, fresh knowledge, fresh insight into who you are and who you've made us to be. And so bless your word to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I was, I was given some chocolates. Welcome, Sean. Nice to have you. You're late, so you can't have a chocolate. I have some chocolates, but I'm, I'm not going to give them away, so we'll use them next week. Probably not. <laughs> they will, I promise you, even if I have to buy one. Um, let's get back into our book of 1 John, where we're going through um, this living in fellowship, living with Christ, living with each other, living with God. And last week, I should say I'll give you a chocolate, but you probably will remember. Who is coming? Well done. I was waiting for somebody to say the Antichrist. Well done, Sean. But, but the, the Scriptures say this, as we looked at last week, the Antichrist is coming, and many Antichrists have already been. And so when we start to read that, we start, should be saying, well, as I understand Scripture, the Antichrist is coming, but we can add to that, do not be afraid. If I'm a Christ child, I'm not afraid if the Antichrist comes. Many little Antichrists have already come. Well, that challenges us then. We need to be on our guard. We need to be watching because they don't only come from outside, they come from inside as well. And we know from what we looked at last week, the Antichrist himself will come up out of God's family, out of God's church. And so the little Antichrists that have already come, we need to be on our guard. We need to be watching for those that would lead us astray, away, as John said, from the apostles' teaching, from the truth of Scripture. And we also touched on last week that we need to live in Christ. And so we need to take what we know, what we've heard, and what we've believed, and we need to implement that into our lives so that we can stand firm. So that when the little antichrists come, we can stand firm on what the truth is. John goes on now a little bit further to help us understand in this challenge of the antichrists who we are. Who am I? Where do I fit? And with that, he says to us, you can have hope. That yes, there might be challenges, there might be struggles, but you can have hope. And so if we just jump into 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. I just want to touch on these before we go in. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed of him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. So again, he says to us, you are my little children, you are my little born-again believers. So you're in the faith, but I'm going to speak to you that you need to continue in Christ. The, the actual word that is used there, we lose a bit of power, is abide in Christ, which is a far deeper, more intimate, more powerful word. Because it speaks more than not of just living with Him, but actually being immersed, actually being consumed by Christ. We need to abide in Him. Are we compliant? Do we have attitudes that are surrendered to Christ? Or are we still living under our own strength? And so the word abide is far more determined. It's a far stronger uh, commitment from us. 
And so he's coming to us and saying, are you living in fellowship? Are we observing all the rules? If you sit here this morning, can I ask you, have you observed all the rules of Christ this week? Probably not. Are we enduring in the struggle? Are we seeing the struggle through? Are we holding to his call and to his word? Are we doing that? Are we able to say that we are in fellowship? He says to us, I need you to abide in Christ for a very good reason, because you need to be in good standing when he comes again. You need to be in good standing. If you don't pay your fees at your gym, you can't get in because you're not in good standing. And so what, what he's saying to us here is you need to be in good standing in your relationship with Christ when he comes again, before him at his coming, it says. The actual original says, if he were to appear, which is a very different connotation to us even. If he were to appear, not saying Jesus might come, because we know from Scripture Jesus is coming. The challenge for us, Yana, is are you in good standing if he were to appear right now? That changes it a little bit for you and I as we sit here this morning. If Jesus came right now, our rapture chute opened, and Jesus came this way, would you be in good standing with Christ in your faith? Would you be able to say, Lord, I've seen what, what John was writing to us, and I'm living in the light. I'm not a liar. I'm living in you in faith. Or would Jesus say, I've watched your life, and sadly you're living in the darkness, and you are unrighteous in my sight. That's what he's coming to us here. Are we abiding in Christ that if he had to come right now, you and I would be in good standing? The question we have then for us, well, what does that look like? It's no use saying to us, well, you need to be in good standing. How do we do that? Well, John tells us. If you know what, that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. So if we break that down very simply, those who learn to know God learn to act like God. Those who learn to know God learn to act like God. That's not saying we can puff ourselves up with pride and say, look, I'm like a God. You can call me a little God. He's not saying that. He's saying you see the God, you see Jesus, and you begin to live like Jesus. You begin to reflect Jesus in everything that you do. Simply put, is your life about striving to be obedient to Jesus. Your lifestyle is everything you do, striving to take you closer to Christ. That's all he's saying to us. So in your life now, if Jesus had to come, would you be able to say, Lord, I am in good standing with you because everything I do, I'm trying to do for you. I'm trying to focus on you. I'm trying to live for you. I'm trying to be obedient to you. I know I'm not getting it right all the time, but I'm doing what I can. Can you say this morning, if he came through the roof right now, could you say, I know Jesus, I trust Jesus, and I live for Jesus? And would he nod and say, I've seen you. You are in good standing with me. Are we able to trust him with everything? See, often we say, well, I need to trust God with, with the big things and the little things I'll just deal with on my own. Or I can trust him with the little things, but the big things, I don't know if he can deal with those. We have to come to this place of saying, Lord, everything. I'll give you the little, Lord, I'm struggling with patience. Help me. Lord, I'm struggling with anger. Help me. What do you need this morning to give to Christ? I'm sure every one of us. If you were here, I think I might have shared this at our, at our, our breakfast we had. That I had to share, I was afraid of the dark until about the age of 35. Which is quite an interesting thing for a grown man. And so often when there are things we, we are afraid of or things we don't know how to do, we do everything we can to beat that thing. So I strived a lot to try and beat my fear of darkness. It, it's really difficult for a 30-year-old man to come home to an house on his own and put every light on and look under every bed and every cupboard in case somebody's there. That's a fear that was irrational, but I needed to deal with it. I think for me, when I, when I look back as I was sitting trying to think, where did this come from? I remember as about a seven-year-old, we lived in a, in a suburb called Amalinda in East London. And when you came into the house, we had the lounge on the left, and I had the first bedroom. It was a tiny little bedroom because I was the little light lumicky. 
And I remember for about the age of seven, every single night for a few weeks, a big transparent white man stood in my room and watched me. Every single night. And when I put the light on, he was gone. And I believe from that moment I became afraid of the dark, that I would not ever want to be out of the light. But when I got to 35, I realized, I need to give something to Jesus. And so I gave him that fear. And everything that came with that fear, now I can live in the dark. I don't have to put the lights on when I get home. Okay, I've got a Dexter that goes with me. <laughs> but some of you have been to my house, you know Dexter. But I don't need to put the lights on. I don't need to look under the bed. I don't need to look in the cupboard. See, I just took a little thing that was hindering me from a freedom, and I gave it to him. And then slowly but surely, we begin to give the other things. We see, he can actually do this. I'm a child of God. And a father looks after his children in everything, not just the big things, the little things. And so I had to give it to him. And so I've got to ask you this morning, as you sit here, what are the things or what is that one thing right now that you are struggling with that is holding you back from living a life of trust? Only you know. I, I just look at a lot of faces looking at me. Some are anticipated, some are snoozing, others are looking a little bit confused. But what is that one little thing right now you might have to say, Lord, I'm going to start with this thing. As a child of God, I'm going to start with this one little thing and give it to you now. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you're afraid. Maybe there's a little bit of bitterness. Maybe there's jealousy. Maybe there's unforgiveness. Maybe there's lust or pride. Or if I read Romans chapter 1, let me, let me read a little bit of Romans 1 for you. I can find it. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Woo! That's a bit harsh. But that's. Paul just saying, these are the things our people struggle with, and if you keep holding on to them, you cannot be abiding in Christ. I need to be in a position where if Jesus came right now, I would not be ashamed to stand before him, because I've given everything. If you're striving to live for Christ, I would say then you have nothing to worry about. But what happens if you're not? What happens if you're holding on to some of those things that you need to give away? What I should actually do now is say, let's stop here quickly. And if you've got something that you know you need to give to God for you to stand up. To say, Lord, let's do it now in front of other people. To say, I'm doing it. And I'm going to live free. Do you have something? Something that you're saying, Lord, I'm held, I've held on to this for too long. And I want to give it to you. That's that, that boogeyman in the dark that stands up and frightens me. I want to be standing before you, Lord, that I'm not ashamed. Lord, as, as your children stand before you, Lord, I, I know all of them. And Lord, they love you and they, they live for you. But Lord, we know that the evil one works in our, in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives and in our circumstances to distract us from the prize to distract us from the goal of, of living a life that is free. And so, Lord, I pray for everyone that is standing. I pray for those that are afraid that are still sitting. I pray for those who might listen to this. And, Lord, I ask that you would do a wondrous work in them. Lord, you have said that you are the great physician. You are the great provider. You are the great healer. You are the, the God of peace, the God of all sufficiency. And so I pray, Lord, whatever it is, each one of these is bringing to you, Lord, I pray that your grace would abound. I pray that you would restore what has been eaten and you'd give back to them everything that has been taken. We ask you, Lord, I ask you to bless each one and help them to live truly as children of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Sometimes it takes courage. I was standing with you. Sometimes I feel like I'm preaching to you and then when you stand, it's like I'm talking down to you. I'm standing with you. These last few weeks, as I was thinking of this passage and, and going through just the first one and a half chapters 
of John. It's been supposed to be a book that encourages us, but actually I've, at times I've felt this has been a little bit of a, a whipping. Because John has been really harsh in saying, you guys are living in the darkness. If Jesus is not in you, then you are a liar. And, and maybe it, sometimes it feels like, oh, this is just going on and on and on. And so well, let's read this passage and see what is actually going on in the next piece of this passage. And it's an incredible few verses, three verses actually. It's what I want to touch on today. And it's incredible because it helps me understand who I am. It helps me understand. All the songs that the team sang this morning spoke around God and who we are. Children of the living God. Amazing grace into our life. I am special. I know a lot of you are very special too. Some of you are more special than others. But we are special. And when I read this passage, it's like God was speaking to me, sitting in my office, like God was saying to me, Barry, this is you. Just so that you can get encouraged again for Sunday. I, I'm I don't want to embarrass one of the ladies at the back, but she came and prayed for, stood with me and gave me a hug before the service because of what I've got to preach. Because if you look at my notes, you're going to be quite frightened because that's all I have, stuff like that. Some arrows and some pages and some scribbles. But our God was saying, Barry, let's encourage this week. Let's just read the passage, but in the passage, let's read it for you quickly. Chapter three, so we can get onto it because we need to get coffee by half past. God is also good because the power came back after 15 minutes. So that means we can put the coffee machine on. God is good. Amen. See, see, this is what he's saying. So he's, he's spoken coming out of chapter 1 where he's been talking about the light and the darkness and the antichrist and all this. He says, but see, look, look and see what great love the Father has lavished on us. That we should be called children of God and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall be, see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. When you begin to read that, those three verses, there's so many things. This is who you will be. You are the children of God. You are friends of God. It's just packed, packed with identity for me. And I could ask you as you sit here this morning and say to you, how many of you ask this question? Because I do sometimes still, even in my faith. Who am I? Who am I really? Where do I fit in to the picture? Where do I fit into this church? Where do I fit into my school? Where do I even fit into my family? A question I asked many times. At some stage, I thought I was adopted. Some of you probably had that same thing. Some of you might wish you'd been adopted. But where do I fit, Lord? Because I don't know who I am. And you know my struggle I had with that for many years until I met Jesus. Why did God make me? Or maybe it might even be, does anybody really care from you? Sometimes that can be, you know, where people come to church and sometimes they sneak in and they sit down and it's like, does anybody even see me? Does anybody even know that I'm here? Am I lovable? Can I actually ever be loved? You know, we, we live this, this lie. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never harm me. What a lie that is. Because we, we grow up and things are said to us and maybe in our schooling, in our, you'll, you'll never amount to much. And it breaks our spirits. And then we, we get a job and, and maybe we don't fit and then we get released or retrenched. Like, why did they retrench me and not Bob? Am I of any value? And life just goes down. But God sent his son to die for you and me. Surely I have some value. Surely I am lovable. Surely I fit into a far bigger picture than what I think I can see. It's this big picture. God's picture. And not one of us came into this world. Don't ever let anybody tell you, you were an accident. How many children have been told that? Live their lives. I was an accident. My mom and dad didn't plan me. You were never an accident. God had a plan. But we live a life where Satan whispers and he's 
these minions whisper into our lives. And sometimes our parents or our friends or our teachers or our bosses or whatever, maybe even at times our spouses whisper into us. And we fail to see who we are in Christ. We fail to see who Jesus has made us to be. And as I read this passage and I I go through it, it's, it's like Jesus was saying to me, Barry, you need to know who you are. Because then you can stand firm. You need to know that you can stand in me because I've said I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you always. That no matter what the day throws up, no matter what the challenge, you can face it. Even when it just seems like, Lord, I'm done now. I can't do this anymore. We seem to get the strange boost of power because God is with us. See, he says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we might be called the children of God. What does this mean to me? What, is it, what does it mean for you, especially those of us who are struggling? If you were there that Saturday, you would know, I felt so unloved in my life that nobody really cared. I, I suffered with rejection. But God loves us so much. There's a story in Mark chapter five. We looked at this when we did Mark four years ago. There's a story of a woman who had bleeding for 12 years. And she was struggling. She was considered unclean, so she couldn't go worship. She couldn't go to town. She was ostracized by everybody. I wonder how she felt about being loved. Even her own family would have had nothing to do with her. And Jesus comes past with this huge crowd of people, and Jesus probably in the middle because everybody wants to listen to him, and they want to be close to him. And she's coming. She says, I want to get to Jesus. But they live in a society which if we think today might be a chauvinistic society, those guys were serious about it. So she wouldn't have been able to get to speak to Jesus because he's this big rabbi. But on top of that, she's unclean. So she couldn't even get into the crowd. So being there was a miracle on its own. But she gets into this crowd and she managed to get to a place where Jesus walks past. This crowd's all around him. Can you see it in your head? Like I can. And she doesn't even call us. She says, I'm just going to touch his cloak just quickly. If I just touch his cloak, something will happen. And she reaches out and she touches his cloak and immediately Jesus stops and says, somebody touch me. Because it says, and the power went out of him. He says, I felt it, something happened. Somebody touched me. And the woman says it was me. Now, there's a lot of ramifications around. But what nobody really picks up is there was this huge crowd of people and Jesus stopped the entire crowd for one lady. For one lady. That's how much he loved her. He stopped to speak with her. God stops things for us. Friends, we are loved beyond understanding by the king. So however you feel this morning, if you're asking those questions, where do I fit? Go to the king. Go to the one who loves you. The the fullness, as I thought this through, we've got Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The whole trinity is in us. They were all there at creation and at when Jesus was at the cross. God could have said, God could easily have said, you know what, they're a bunch of sinners. Well, so sorry for them. He could have said, that crowd, they reject me. Why should I help them? He could have said, they all disobey my rules and now they're all in trouble. They can suffer their own consequences. Does he do that? No. Does he let us run on our own? No. He says, I better get a plan together to fix this. And so he sends Jesus. And so as we live to see if we're in good standing, if we're sinners, if we reject Christ, if we deny the cross, then I'm sorry for you. Because then what Jesus said will happen to those who are unbelievers will happen to you. But for those who know Jesus, for those of us who understand that we need a Savior, everything changes. When the cross became a reality, everything changed for you and for me. The whole of creation restored. Victory in Christ. Redemption, reconciliation, and restoration. So I I sat at my desk. This has been a rough week trying to think. So sermon was finished, then changed. Then finished, then changed. Then other things happened. And then it just got to me. I was sitting at my desk getting ready to move on and these scriptures just came into my head. It was like, these are what you need to touch on. Especially for those, I'm not going to ask you this, but there are people sitting here right now that feel a little bit lost. 
in their journey, with maybe in their marriage, maybe in their journey with Christ, maybe in their jobs, they're just a little bit lost. And there are definitely some here that feel unworthy this morning, that they don't meet the standard that somebody has put on them. And God wants to say to us this morning, and to you, you're a child of God. This is who you are. And this is what has, is what, yes, this is what has been given to you. So we're going to bounce a little bit. We've got to, we're going to have to move quickly. I said to somebody this week, I'm going to shorten my sermons, but that didn't work. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. Therefore, so we've come from Abraham's faith. He's brought into a place of salvation. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, since Jesus did everything on the cross for us, since our faith in him has made us to be declared not guilty, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace through the king in whom we have a relationship with, and he is the savior, Lord Jesus Christ, king, friend, savior, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The first two things, when we became children of the living God, we got given two things. Did you read them there? Peace and hope. How many of us live without peace? We're always in turmoil. We're always anxious. We're always worried about stuff. And he's saying, I'm giving you peace beyond that. I'm giving you peace with the living God who is the one who can destroy you but doesn't. I'm giving you peace of this God who created all things. I'm giving you that same peace. And with that peace comes this rejoicing in hope. We are so often a hopeless people. We as Christians, we should be saying, I see what's happening around me. But you know what? Tomorrow is going to be a better day. I realized the other day, and it was like a, it's such a simple thing, but I realized I, I went and did something. And I, I stood there and I thought, you know, I'm about two minutes closer to my death than I was then. That's quite a morbid thought. But every single breath we take, we are closer to God now than we were when we started the service. Do you realize that? We are closer to dying and going to glory than we were a little while ago. And that might sound morbid, but for me that gives me hope because I'm getting there sooner. I know somebody chirped this week that when the plane crashed in Tanzania, the plane crashed. And I was in Tanzania. You know what the chirp was? I'm not going to tell them, Leon. <laughs> but you know what he chirped? He's not getting to heaven before me. You see, that might sound like a joke, but we should be saying, I want to get to heaven sooner because I have hope in something better than this. Because I'm excited about Jesus. I'm excited about the joy that he's going to give to me. And then he goes on in this passage, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we come along and we say, but I have no value. While I was still a sinner out of God's thing, he said, I want him. I want her. I want them. And he died for us. Gave us great value. Are you valuable? I want to say to you, you're valuable to me. Because I see when I look around and I see some of the empty chairs, I'm thinking, where are they? What's wrong with them? Why are they not here? Not because we want to fill chairs, but because they're part of our family. And they're valuable to us, and we care for them, and we love them. Where are they? Why are they not with us? And we, we get broken, and we get torn. You know that illustration of the, the 100 rand note that's nice and new, and everybody thinks it's got great value, and then you crumple it up and spit on it, whatever. It's still got the 100 rand value if you go to the shop. It doesn't look so good, but it still has value. That is us. So when you walk in here, and I look around, some are hurting, some are struggling, some are angry, some are bitter. But we all have the same value in Christ's eyes. And you are valuable this morning. And you are able to be forgivable. That's one of the things we really struggle with. In Christ, I'm able to forgive because I have been forgiven. Let me remind you what I said to you a little while ago. We need to be able to forgive ourselves. And if we cannot forgive ourselves, then in a way we're denying Christ. We're saying to Jesus... You died on the cross for me, but my issue that I have is bigger than you. In a way, you're rejecting what happened at the cross. You're saying Jesus' grace is insufficient for me because what I did is too bad. So I can forgive Shane for saying what he did, but I can't forgive me for what I said to Shornish. That's a skewed grace. 
We cannot say, I can forgive them, but not myself. That is denying the cross. You've got to be able to say, I am valuable, and I'm forgivable, and I'm able to forgive. That's part of what God has given to us. That's the hope that he puts into us. That is the, the, the joy and the glory that he puts into us. And the passage goes on, and it talks about suffering, but in that suffering, we come closer to Christ. The passage moves on, and it talks about um, what we call federal theology, sin of one man and the sin of one man. So the sin came into the world through Adam, sin goes out of the world through Christ. That's how it works. But he moves on a little bit into, I think, the greatest chapter in the entire Bible. So just read the last few verses of Romans chapter 5. It says, consequently, verse 18, consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brought life to all men. Let me move down a bit. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's where chapter 5 ends. Then it moves to chapter 8. Because of what Jesus did, this grace that comes in and this righteousness that he's given to us, therefore, uh, you should know this scripture by now because I quote it so often. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we live these lives of condemnation and insufficiency and being without value and thinking we unloved and thinking we rejected. And he says to us here, you can do away with that condemnation because you have value. Then what many don't see, as you read chapter eight, it's broken into different pieces. There's like something and then there's a counter to it, something and a counter to it. So I'm just gonna read to you out of chapter eight, some you can see in my Bible, it's in orange. So I'm going to read you the orange bits, which your Bible doesn't have. Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. God did this by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the nat sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. And those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Exactly what John has been telling us. Living according to the Spirit in righteousness with Christ. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Again, are you living a life striving towards Christ? Are you, is your life a life of peace? You, verse 9, you, however talking to us, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, by the Spirit of God that lives within you. If Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Further down, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. That speaks so much into you and I around our lifestyle in Christ and how we have been set free. Can I ask you, are you living a life of freedom? Are you living as a child of the living God, set apart from those things, or are you still struggling? That passage goes on. So I think it's one of the greatest passages because it talks about this change in our lifestyle, getting rid of our sinful nature, moving to the life of the Spirit, and then it says, all things work for the good of those who are called according to Jesus, called according to His purpose. And it goes on and says, For those God foreknew, all, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. He's not talking about Calvinism, just so that will help you. Not talking about predestination. Okay? goes on, That he foreknew and predestined uh, to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, bringing us in again into the family, and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. When you become a, a child of God, God calls you. Remember, we don't get saved because we choose Jesus. We get saved because Jesus chose us. We get called into his family. And then when we come to a place of repentance and come into salvation, we are justified, declared not guilty. 
And we are waiting with hope for the next piece. So when you look at me standing here, you see a called, justified man who's not yet been glorified. But it's coming. It's coming. One day, I will be glorified. Peter talks about this hope of the salvation that is to come. And so I can live this life of hope. Tomorrow doesn't have any fear for me because tomorrow brings me closer to my glorification, to when I will be with Christ. Goes on. What then shall we say to this? What shall we say? Friends, if you call yourself a child of God, what should you say to this, knowing what has just been written? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the end of Romans 8, nothing. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Are you a child of God? Are you a child of God this morning? I want to wrap up for you this morning with, with one more passage. A book I think we need to go through in the new year. Book, book of Ephesians. I keep referring to it. And we need to look at it. But this, when I become a child of God, this is what happens to me. Remember, Ephesians, this is what God did. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons. That is who we are. We have been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Why do I need to live trying to work out who I am? Why do I struggle with my identity? We start saying, well, what does that look like then? I have that, that question from a friend of mine. He says, I really struggle with preachers. He's also a pastor, but he, he doesn't run a church. But he says, every time I hear a sermon, the sermons are good, but there's no practical stuff in it. So this passage, we say, well, then what does those blessings look like? Well, he goes on. And you also were included in Christ, verse 13, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. That's the beginning of what we've had. For this purpose, verse 15, or sorry, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, Loving God, loving each other. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us to believe. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And so the blessings we have in the heavenly realms, every spiritual blessing is picked up here for us. We have hope. Hope in salvation. Hope in redemption. Hope in future glory. We know we can live in joy. We know we can live in peace. We know we can develop and, and grow the fruit of the Spirit. We know that ultimately we will be victorious. We have the riches of Christ. We have eternal life. We have a relationship with Him. We have community. See, we have the riches, not just in Christ, but we have the riches in the saints. So if you're not a church, how do I spend your riches? If you're not here, I have riches in you, in my relationship with you, in my fellowship with you. You need to be here so that I can be blessed. And I need to be here so that you can be blessed. We have everything we need in each other. We also have great power. Great power to overcome. I do not have a spirit of power, but of love and of, sorry, of love and of power and of a great mind. I don't have a spirit of fear. 
not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I have the ability to endure everything because Jesus is in me and because I am a child of the living God. Can you say that this morning? If you had to say it before God, would you say it as a lie? Because you can say it to me, but can you say it to him? And he ends off and he says, I have marked you with a seal. And it's, it's not some mark on your head, but it's a mark of the Holy Spirit. You and I at salvation are filled with the Holy Spirit. That is our seal, guaranteeing our blessing in the heavenly realms with all the riches, all the power, all the grace, all the goodness of God. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Do we get it this morning? As I sat and read this passage, for me, I needed to, to be looking at myself and saying, Barry, do I fit in here still? After all these years, can I still say that I fully understand what it means to be a child of God? Do I fully understand what it means to live free? To live knowing that that which I'm going to be still hasn't come, but it's coming. How many sitting here this morning are living feeling rejected? Maybe you're feeling denied. Maybe you're feeling like you don't have any value. Maybe you're feeling like things I've done can't be forgiven. They're just too bad. Maybe you're feeling like, Lord, I've come into you, but I don't know what to do. I don't have the ability. I'm feeling quite incapable of doing what you've asked me to do. Lord, how can anybody love me? That's probably one of the, the things so many struggle with. Lord, look at me. Maybe look at my outside, what I am. How, do, how can somebody love this? Maybe you just feel like, Lord, this is, what's the point? What's the point of all of this? See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Friends, we are special people. We are the children of the living God. And He has made us more than conquerors. You know, I can do all things. doesn't mean I can fly. But it means I can do all things through Christ in me who strengthens me because he loves me. Maybe we've already stood earlier on. They said one thing you needed to give up. But I'm going to ask you to stand again. I struggled with rejection for most of my life until I met Jesus. Maybe you need to meet Jesus. Maybe you've walked a long journey with Christ, but you've never truly met Jesus. You have this picture in your head of what it means to be a Christian, but Jesus doesn't fit there. Maybe you're feeling like you have no value, maybe in your marriage, maybe in your job, maybe as a child you've, with your parents, I don't know. And maybe you just feel like, how can anybody love me? If that's you, everybody just, maybe close your eyes so you can't see people standing up because maybe some people are afraid. But if that is you, I want to pray for you. I struggled many years feeling like I couldn't be loved, rejected, without value. But Jesus made me more than that. Lord, we thank you that your word can speak so clearly to us. Thank you that your word doesn't come with any condemnation. Your word comes to us to grow us and to teach us and to encourage us and to, and to reveal you to us so that we might have hope, that we might have peace and joy. So Lord, I pray for each of us, especially for those that are, are, have expressed something in their lives again. Lord, thank you that you make us new, that you make all things new. And thank you that you've given us the privilege of approaching that throne of grace with a boldness to come before you and say, Lord, to say, Dad, this is my issue. Dad, I'm struggling. Dad, help me. And Lord, we don't come with an, an irreverence. We come with an understanding that we are your children, saved by you, for you. And so, Lord, I pray we would come before you with this, this sense of need, of knowing 
and have a certainty of trust to know that you are the one who can fix all things. You are the one that says in Hebrews, who sustains all things. You are the one who purifies all things. So Lord, I just commit us all to you. And Lord, ask whatever it is that we're struggling with, that you would help us. Remind us that you have lavished, lavished such a great love upon us to make us children of the living God. And so Lord, would you bless your word to us to encourage us. In Jesus' name, amen.